Good morning. Good morning. My name's Elaine Miller, and I'm your lay leader this morning, and I'm also an elder. We are glad that you are here to worship with us, both in person and online. Welcome to Bush Hill Church. For those of us congregating here inside, we ask you to wear a mask as a way to protect the youngest among us who are unvaccinated. The mission at Bush Hill Presbyterian Church is this. As we grow in the knowledge of God's word and share Christian community, God changes lives through us. We aren't perfect. We come together in trust that in life and in death and in life beyond death, we belong to God and we belong to each other. The Holy Spirit makes us the body of Christ. When you would like to belong to us more formally, please speak to Pastor Barbara about membership. Our bulletin is online as well as in the sanctuary. Please take it home and use it for your prayer during the week. Are there any announcements for the good of this body of Christ? Yes, Pat Bauer has an announcement. This has to do with pillows. It's time for pillow stuffers to start again. The Mended Hearts chapter of American Heart Association, who sponsors this program, has contacted those of us who used to uh, uh, arrange groups of sewers and stuffers. Over the last 18 months, they've distributed 800 of these pillows at hospitals in Northern Virginia, not through volunteers going into the hospital, but through the nursing staff. But what that means is that their inventory is considerably diminished, and now they need our help again. So starting Monday, November 8th, we'll have an organizational meeting in the Friendship Room at 10 o'clock. This will be a working session. We'll have stuffing and pillows and sewing kits, but we'll also do some organizing. We'll decide when we want to meet, how often we want to meet, how many pillows we want to stuff. So if you've helped us in the past, please come Monday at 10, November the 8th, and help us start stuffing and sewing again. If you haven't helped us, but you're curious, please come check us out. I look forward to seeing many of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'm so happy that Pillow Stuffers is up and running again. And now a report from Maureen about our fabulous day yesterday. Thank you, Pastor Barbara. Good morning. I just wanted to share a few quick thank yous. Um, we were blessed with a gorgeous fall day yesterday to hold our trunk or treat and the youth group's yard sale. So I wanted to say thank you to Pastor Barbara and Elaine Miller and Alice Gillespie and Jamie Reese for decorating their trunks. Grace and Tom McKay for helping set up food and making sure that ran smoothly. Um, Erica decorla Souza helped uh, coordinate the event and she is an organizational wizard. Uh, so her sign-up genius really helped us to have the volunteers needed. Speaking of which, Brenda Bring, who signed up to run the info table. Thank you, Brenda. The yard sale was fabulous. Thanks uh, to Rolando and Bonnie Sanchez and all of the youth who made that possible. I believe I heard they raised over $600, which is just fabulous that they'll be able to use for their events. Um, and was there food yesterday? There was. <laughs> So I think if you know, if you ever see on any of our uh, bulletins or um, emails that John and Betty Free are cooking, do what you can to get there because it's fabulous. <laughs> they clearly cook with love um, and they did more than just nourish our bellies yesterday. They nourished our whole beings. So thank you, John and Betty. And there are leftovers, so please join us in the Narthex uh, for lunch. And many of you who just showed up to support this event and share in the uh, beautiful day and the fellowship. Thank you. Yes, we're alive. Now, Betty Faree, I'm coming to you because this is a $100 donation for the, your cookie ministry, which is next Sunday. We're gonna dedicate our cookies for our college students. And that donation comes to us from Reverend Kim of our evangelical Thanksgiving Korean church. And he, it's a small donation, he said, but he wants to make sure to give. It's a huge donation. And also, um, as she said, next Sunday we'll be uh, blessing our cookies, but we need lots of cookies to bless. So please make your favorite cookies, bring them up into the, to the narthex before church, and if you can, package them in uh, Ziploc bags, half a dozen cookies per bag, dozen cookies per bag. Uh, we'll take whatever we can get, but we need lots of cookies. 
And also, too, if you have a college-age student or know of one that you want to send cookies to and you don't think I have your, their address, their mailing address, where they actually pick up mail, please give that to me. Uh, email it to me or uh, give it to me today. Thank you. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Emily Williams will be here next week preaching, and she's bringing two students from Arise Campus Ministry. And uh, so that's going to be wonderful because Emily is wonderful, Emily, who has passed all four of her ordination exams. <laughs> we have an ordina her ordination, I think, in January, so I hope we show up for that. Okay, other announcements for the good of the, the life of the body of Christ? Thank you. Now let us prepare for worship and let the music open our hearts and minds to God's presence with us. Please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea, though the water be raised in foam, and though the There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of this city, which shall not be overthrown. 
God shall help it at the break of day. God has spoken, and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now and look upon the works of the Lord. What awesome things God has done on earth. It is God who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear, and burns the shields with fire. Be still then, and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let us worship God. seated. We come to God to confess our sins, and I want you to know that as I create, I don't create these sins from we, these sins. Oh, start <laughs> over, Barbara. Well, maybe I do create some sin. I'll own it. Uh, when I create the worship service, I have come to the place where I take scripture that's assigned for the lectionary, and usually for the prayer of confession, I, I pick a scripture, and then I go negative, and it's amazing what we confess. So today's confession comes to us from the book of Romans, which is a, a strong book. So for our healing and our wholeness, our freedom, our restoration, let's join together and confess our sins. Oh God, we are reminded in Paul's letters to the Romans that we too trust in whatever the law says and we justify ourselves by the law, thereby missing the grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us, sinners all. Through the law, 
comes the knowledge of sin. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy upon us, sinners all. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us, sinners all. The righteousness of God is disclosed through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. God did this to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. By the law of faith, of faith, we give thanks that we are justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. Rejoice in this word from Paul's letter to the Romans and in Jesus's words, I do not condemn you. Go, sin no more. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, crucified by human power and raised by God's power, tells us repeatedly, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not peace as the world gives, but as I give. So do not let your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. be seated. With the burden of sin lifted, our hearts and minds are ready to hear and listen to the word of God. Let us pray now that God gives us ears to hear. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, like Nicodemus, we come to the world with many questions. Like the Pharisees, we can be captivated by correctness, intent on right answers. Like faithful disciples, as we turn to your word, Spirit of God, let not our desire for information dominate our need for transformation. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see the future you have planned for us. Move us together to greater faith and obedience. Amen. I spy Jeb, and I also know he's a little reluctant to come forward. So what do you think, Therese? Should I do it from here, or does he want to come forward? Did I see him? Yes. I can do it from here if he's more comfortable. You know, it's great to see you, Jeb. Oh, and you're all dressed up. I love it. Today, we are celebrating, uh, we are remembering the Reformation and the Reformation is um, a social movement of people who thought and thought and thought a lot about Christian faith. And they decided they wanted to change how people thought about it. And so in the sermon, I'll tell you about Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox. But what they did was read and read and think and talk together with others and they, God changed their hearts. And God wants us to also read and think together 
so that we have a good Christian education. So I brought some books that I will walk back to you with you, but one of the things we need to do as Christians is to always read the Bible. And they have translated the Bible into words that are easy for you to understand. And here's a story Bible about the Berenstein Bears. And here is a Bible story with different pictures. So it's so important not just to read these stories, but to talk with one another about what they mean. And when we talk about them, about what they mean, their meaning gets deeper. And so I have all these books for you. I'm gonna take them back with you, to, and you can look at them um, you know, with your mom during the worship service, and then you can leave them in the pews when you're done. You know what else I have? I have books for adults, too. And here's a book called We're Not Broke. And this is written by the fabulous campus minister at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he helps us think about how we can use all our space to serve the community. So there are always things to know and learn. So let's walk these books back. Oh, and I have about 10 times more. Let's go back to your mom. And now you have something to look at while I talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> and talk and talk and talk. The point is we all always need to be learning. All right, amen. The gospel lesson today comes to us from the gospel according to John, the eighth chapter, starting with verse 31. Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Listen for a word from the Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will make us free? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Keep these words in your heart. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, as the wind and cleanse. Come, Holy Spirit, as the fire and burn. Come, Holy Spirit, as the light and illumine. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us, until we are all wholly thine. Amen. Few people today care about denominational affiliation, whether you're Presbyterian or Catholic or Methodist. And increasingly, we are living with the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, who are choosing not to be Christians. But that ease with which people make these decisions was not so 500 years ago when Martin Luther started the Reformation by nailing 95 theses to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, 504 years ago. Whether or not someone is Presbyterian or Christian, we all remain hugely influenced by the Reformation. 
Luther's thinking as well as John Calvin's and John Knox and what they thought was at stake. And it carries through today through the Puritans and the Protestants who shaped the early religious and political life of these United States. Many with a Calvinist point of view and emphasis on hard work and discipline, the salvation of souls and the building of a better world. Presbyterians were instrumental in movements from, for women's rights and the abolition of slavery and temperance. And today, I think we're putting our shoulder to the wheel to abolish racism. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, these are our church fathers. Luther's was an attempt to reform the doctrines and practices of Catholicism, but instead of changing or the Catholic Church, a, a new church was formed. Martin Luther hated the way uh, indulgences were sold for the forgiveness of sins, and they were purchased often to the financial detriment and hardship of those who were poor and, and marginalized. He didn't believe there needed to be an intermediary between people and God, and he developed the idea of the priesthood of all believers, which we believe today, which means I, as your pastor, am not higher over you. I am alongside you. My function is simply different. And whether you're a lay person or a pastor, when you are a ruling elder together with me, a teaching elder, we are equals. We are equals. Martin Luther also asserted that salvation is a gift that God gives those who have faith. And he believes in justification by faith alone, that scripture alone is authoritative. And he's the one who translated the Bible into the people's common language so that people could take personal responsibility for their faith and interpret scriptures for themselves and not be dependent on the priest's point of view. He believed that people should be independent in their relationship with God, but not necessarily apart from a practicing Christian community. Well, who is John Calvin? He's a, he's a French lawyer who, who fled from France to Switzerland and he finally landed in Geneva. He, he thought similarly to Martin Luther. And in Geneva, he was able to experiment with his ideal of a discipled community of the elect. And the town council liked Calvin's ideas so much that they enacted his ecclesiastical ordinances which set forth regulations for the whole city on issues like church order, religious training, gambling, dancing, even swearing. And it went into effect citywide. Calvin believed that God chooses us before we choose God. And he introduced entirely new ways of doing communion. He no longer believed that Jesus Christ was sacrificed every time the Lord's Supper was shared. This is not an altar, by the way. This is the Lord's table. We do not sacrifice Jesus every month when we share communion together. We have elements of bread and cup, which we uh, consider as symbols and Therefore, our spiritual partaking of the body and blood of Christ, but we don't actually eat the body and blood of Christ. And it's Calvin who created the Presbyterian form of government and identified the office of elder, ruling elder, for lay people, in addition to pastor, teacher, deacon. So that's why lay people, as ruling elders, may administer the sacraments together with the pastor, something that would never be possible in the Roman Catholic or the church or the Eastern Orthodox Church. This was all part of Luther's idea, the priesthood of all believers. And then there's John Knox, who spent time with John Calvin in Geneva, and he went back and started the Reformation in Scotland through Presbyterianism. 
The French reformer described Knox as a brother laboring energetically for the faith. Knox, for his part, was so impressed with Calvin's Geneva that he called it the city. He called the city the, the perfect school for, of Christ that was ever on earth since the days of the apostle. Why? And Knox primarily used his pen and his power of preaching to change the world, but he was not averse to advocating violent revolution and indeed bloody years followed the Reformation as they struggled over the meaning and definition of the sacraments. John Knox left us though with the democratic form of government that the Church of Scotland adopted and continues to use today as we continue to use today as the United States government uses today this democratic form of governance. So there's a little history on the, on the Reformation and our church fathers who cared a lot about how the church as an institution shaped people's lives and fought for a kind of freedom and truth that involved great risk, even to the point of death, and none of it came without a fight, without bloodshed. Well, even Jesus had a fight on his hands with the children of Abraham <clears throat> as he asserts himself in this passage in John, that he comes from God. In the verses that follow today's passage, you can track a very intense and even raucous debate about belief and believing in Jesus. Jesus has heard the truth from God, but the, the children of Abraham can't believe it. They don't understand what he is saying. They cannot accept his word. Jesus reasons with them that whoever is from God hears the words of God and then judges, you do not hear them because you are not from God. Those are fighting words. The children of Abraham drive him out. And what about for us? For us, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life if we continue in his word. If. We can't take it for granted. The meaning of the truth hinges on that little word, if. The truth of God is revealed in Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus is necessary in order to know the truth and for the truth to set us free. So we don't decide what truth is and define it to the bone, even when we are far happier deciding for ourselves what truth is. Jesus is the truth. God's truth isn't ours, and ours alone. God's truth is ours together. It isn't black or white as if something is only known. It's a mystery, partially known, and yet always beyond us, which is what beckons us to come back again and again and, and look at that same passage Again, but this time with different eyes. And if we're talking about it with a different person, we might see it in a fuller way. I think true believers, whoever they think they are, are slaves to tribal instincts. True believers are slaves to tribal instincts and rely more on grievances than grace, more on resenting our enemies than learning how to love them. They're more invested in putting down other people than building others up in love. That stuff is hard to do. I need your help in order to do it, and you need mine. We need each other to love our enemies. 
These religious tribal instincts are just running rampant. And if you look at it, it's really a mark of success of social media because don't we have access to news 24 seven? We bow down and worship the social media, our news channels, whether it's Fox News or CNN or NPR, we worship our, that, that news cycle more than we spend time in God's word and with God's word. Somehow we can have the news on all the time and think we only need to come to church once or twice a month. James Ernest, now vice president and editor-in-chief at Erdsman, who's a, which is a, a publisher of religious books, sees a massive discipleship failure caused by a massive educational failure, which leads to great hollowness. And nobody likes an empty vacuum. The media shapes us far more than God's word. And it only consumes us and our data. Our faith is a gift, and each one of us here has it. It's also a task. It is a gift and a task, and it's our task to learn, to grow, to commit. Luther and Calvin and Knox shifted the burden of responsibility of discipleship onto each individual within a practicing community of faith to continue in God's word. If we do this, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Not for us to do what we want when we want, but free for us to live into doing God's will, loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, serving others and exuding grace, sharing power generously with those in need, and loving our enemies. I give thanks and praise to God for each one of you for the ways in which you receive this gift of faith and do the work of continuing in God's word. So let's look at one another and give thanks that each one of us is here together drawn to be a living witness of Jesus Christ in an undescribable time, but we have one another and we have love and we have Jesus Christ. And let all God's people say, Amen. <clears throat> so I'm supposed to offer a story about hope, but I'm gonna talk about faith. Um, there were a couple big events in my life that could have been life-changing for some. Um, the first one happened when I was in college in Florida. I uh, was in a car accident with my dog. Her name is Jasmine, actually Lady Jasmine because she was an AKC registered Cocker Spaniel. And she was basically my baby. And my fiance and I were picking up our car um, from the shop. And so I was following behind him uh, on the way home. And I had the brilliant idea of saying, look, look, there's daddy, do you see daddy? And so she got excited and she stepped on my arm and so the steering wheel went this way and then I overcompensated and pulled the steering wheel that way and unfortunately I ended up hitting a drainage ditch in the median of a four lane road that was separated by that median. So hitting that drainage ditch, I flipped the car and it rolled over, and I ended up, when it stopped, um, facing the other direction, going the other way in the, on the other side of the four-lane road. So all of the windows broke, so I was able to just climb out of the car, and I got the dog, because she had run into traffic. That was my biggest concern when I got out of the car. I'm like, get my dog. Um, so I was sitting on the side of the curb. There were lots of people around. People had stopped, because it was, I'm sure, crazy to watch. Um, 
And so somebody must have called 911 because there was a police officer there pretty quickly. And so he came and he looked and he said, who's in the car? And I said, oh, sheepishly, you know, that, that was me. And I didn't look visibly hurt, it was fine. And he, his first reaction was, oh, well, I'll, I'll downgrade the ambulance because they just expected it to be a very big deal. So um, fast forward 15 years. By now we're married, we've got three children and um, we have a house in Vienna and I'm getting another cup of coffee one morning and I noticed that the light on the coffee pot is off. And I was thinking, well, that's weird. Why would that be off? But it's an old house and there's always things going wrong, whatever. So I go downstairs to check the circuit breaker and while I'm down there, now I hear the smoke alarm going off. And I think, oh, now what? Are you kidding me? And I remember thinking in that moment, like, we have got to get this electrical work done. There, it's just, it's dangerous, this is an old house, we just need to make sure that everything checks out. So I go back up and I look for the cause of the smoke alarm and I see smoke curling down the hallway at the ceiling coming from the bedroom. So I go in there to in investigate further. It's in the master bedroom and the drapes are on fire. It's a roiling fire and the drapes are behind our bed. So, of course, I immediately call 911 and I go outside and fortunately nobody else was in the house. The younger kids were on the playground with the dog and the husband and the oldest kid had gone to the gas station to get gas for um, lo mowing the lawn that day. It was a beautiful April day. So um, three engines show up and they put the house, you know, they put the fire out and uh, they get it out pretty quickly, about 15 minutes, but the master bedroom was destroyed and there was a lot of damage to the rest of the house as well. Um, and if that fire had started overnight, I might not have made it out. The smoke detector was in the hallway. It's an old house, it was the only one upstairs, I think. The smoke detector was in the hallway, so by the time that smoke had made it to alert us, I might not have, you know, woken up in time. So, um, so once again, I walked away from an experience with no injuries. Um, and that was a tough time, you know, being out of your house and having three little kids and having, you know, it to all be fixed and that kind of thing. Um, and there were other tough times. Um, there was the failure of my husband's small business, a subsequent bankruptcy filing, and um, not related to those things, but also our marriage ended after 30 years of being together. So, um, but through those tough times, I had peace. I just somehow knew that I was gonna be okay. So my mom is probably partially responsible for that. She is the consummate prayer warrior. She made a cross stitch for my children that, said, that has that saying, um, if you pray, why worry? If you worry, why pray? And that kind of sums it up for me. I just feel like God's got me. He holds me in his hands and he's got a plan for me. And I feel like he brought me here to this community and to this church, Bush Hill specifically. And I'm sure you all have gone through some tough times as well, but we're all here. We're here holding each other up. And as it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So my faith is why I have hope. Things can look bad, and obviously these days there's many things that we can worry about, but I have hope and faith that things are gonna be okay. I've been blessed with my health, good income at a great company, and I feel that it's important to give back. So I'm pledging my commitment for 2022 on Pledge Sunday on November 21st, and I hope you will as well. Thank you. So now, the call for the offering. When we give a gift of money, we are giving part of ourselves. Our giving to Bush Hill Presbyterian Church is shaped by mutual relationships and is a witness to trust. 
trust in leadership, trust in the organization, and trust in the mission. We invite you to give financially to our ministry when you are with us in person, in the sanctuary. You can drop it in the offering plate up front, on the communion table during the offering, offertory. When you're at home and joining us uh, through live stream, you can give your offering online through our website at bushhill.org or send a check to Bush Hill Presbyterian Church. We are grateful for, for all you can give of your time, your talents, and your treasure. Let us join together to pray, saying, You have given so much to me. Give one thing more, a grateful heart. Amen. You may be seated. We are blessed to pray together to the God who creates us and calls us together to be the body of Christ. So join with me in taking in a deep breath and relaxing into these strong hands that, in which God holds us. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, how good and wonderful are you to create us and call us together 
to be the body of Christ here and now. You have given us one shepherd to your scattered sheep to bring them by the sacrifice of his life to you and to one another. We give you thanks for giving this faith community maybe not what it wants, but certainly what it needs in the faith you give each of us and the willingness we are to respond in gratitude for your faith in us. We have chosen the middle, tipping not to the right or not to the left, but holding fast to this gift of community that you give us. Though social media seeks to tear us asunder and sow seeds of fear and resentment, we seek to live into your grace, trusting each other that we are each fearfully and wonderfully made and want to be in relationship with each other and with you. We ask for your forgiveness when our actions divide us from others. We ask for your forgiveness when we are not mindful of all that you have given us. We ask for your forgiveness when we forget that we have to continue in, in your word and continue with each other. We ask for your forgiveness when we think we can just do our own thing and forget that we find you in community. That the truth comes when we wonder together about this word from 2,000 years ago that amazingly still speaks to us and the human dilemmas in which we find ourselves. And we trust that through your church, you will assure us that we are saved and saved to help others. That Jesus Christ alone is Lord of our conscience and his grace is what lifts the burden of our failures. So we thank you for the ease with which we come together and for the great life that has emerged through this terrible pandemic, that we could just hold space on the parking lot with some good music and a yard sale, some delicious pulled pork and people willing to open their trucks so we can watch the children play and be like children in your kingdom. This day, we pray for Don's friend whose mother died because of poor care of her diabetes. Lord, in your mercy. This day, we pray for Karen Horwath as she comes through foot surgery. Lord, in your mercy. This day, we pray for all of those who suffer with chronic disease that limits their life, that they might find freedom in self-care, Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the many ways in which you bless Bush Hill Church with people's willingness to show up and put their shoulder to the wheel so that we might have many hands to do your work in the world. Lord, in your mercy. God in community, holy in one, hear us as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand and sing with me? A mighty fortress is our God.
people of God, let us together continue in God's word and know that the truth will set us free. Go now knowing that there is pulled pork in the narthex. And on Saturday, we want to gather around Linda Kiefer as she celebrates the resurrection of her mother on Saturday at 11 o'clock. And until we come back together, go knowing that the love of God, the grace of our sovereign ruler, Jesus Christ, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit goes with us each day, each step of the way. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.